This is CBC Here and Now. A death in custody. New details about an inmate who died at Her Majesty's Penitentiary. What we know about 33-year-old Jonathan Hinook. A family lost a young man and it didn't have to happen. Police are now calling the death of a young man in downtown St. John's Tuesday night a homicide. Residents in the neighborhood tell us about the increase in violence. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. CBC News has learned the identity of the man who died at Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's yesterday. The 33-year-old from Labrador was facing a first-degree murder charge. Here and Now's Mark Quinn has been following this story. He joins us now live. Mark, what more can you tell us? That's right, Anthony. We have confirmed that it was Jonathan Hinock who died at the penitentiary uh, yesterday. He was supposed to appear here at Supreme Court uh, for a trial, but now we know that won't happen. Hinock was at the penitentiary awaiting trial. He was facing a charge of first-degree murder following the 2016 death of Regula Shuli. Shuli was a well-respected leader in Happy Valley Goose Bay. The 88-year-old was found dead in her home. Police officers were called to the penitentiary yesterday afternoon, and the RNC is continuing to investigate what happened. The union that represents prison guards confirms correctional officers were involved in an incident with Henoch before he died. There were certainly uh, correctional officers uh, that were involved. Uh, we understand a couple of officers may have been initially assaulted. Earl flagged that those officers may have been traumatized by the event. He also said it's likely the incident was caught on video. In the correctional facility, there's cameras everywhere. Uh, inmates know that, correctional officers know that. Uh, and until that investigation comes out, we, we won't know. And I, I just ask people to, to respect that. There's an active investigation not to stir rumors of what occurred. Henoch's next of kin have been notified, and the chief medical examiner is working to determine the cause of his death. Now, there has been a development in this story. Uh, later today, we heard uh, from the lawyer representing uh, Mr. Henoch. Uh, he says that uh, he's now calling for an inquiry into this death. He's calling for the medical examiner to uh, have an inquiry into the death of Mr. Henoch. Uh, but we also spoke with Andrew Parsons uh, today, and he says it's way too soon to start talking about inquiries. He says we have to wait for the investigation into this death to be carried out, and then perhaps we can talk about if that's warranted or not. Live in St. John's, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. And now to an update on that breaking news story we brought you last night. A police canine unit helped catch the inmate who escaped from the West Coast Correctional Center in Stephenville. Timothy Hackett escaped at around 6 p.m. yesterday and was on the run for about six hours before the police tracked him down. According to police, he escaped while in the prison yard scaling two fences and he was later located at a home in Stephenville. Well, police are now calling the death of a young man in downtown St. John's Tuesday night a homicide. The 23-year-old was found bleeding on Bond Street and he later died in hospital. But long before this tragic killing, residents were crying out about growing tensions in their neighborhood. Here now is Ryan Cook reports. It was hard. It was hard. Kelly Hickey had a bad feeling this was coming. She lives in the Bond Street area and has seen an increase in violence in the last two years. It all centers around this house, an emergency shelter, kind of like a boarding house. Before Tuesday's killing, a community association was formed in Hickey's kitchen. Everyone around that table that day, we were trying, we were just discussing how do we get help for the people in that house, because it was very obvious that people in that house needed help. They were in the process of scheduling a meeting with RNC Chief Joe Boland. We didn't even get to the meeting before exactly what we were afraid of happening happened. A 23-year-old man was found clutching his throat, bleeding on the pavement. He wasn't staying at the shelter, but witnesses say he was with a group in the alleyway just outside. It was officially ruled a homicide this morning, but no arrests have been made. Hickey's concerns lie with the lack of resources in shelters like these. As we reported yesterday, government's reliance on these shelters erupted in 2018, and they're not obligated to provide anything more than food and shelter to some clients with very complex needs. And Kelly Hickey's not the only local resident who's spoken about her concerns over this. Former St. John Center MHA Jerry Rogers lives just a few doors down. He is one of many, many vulnerable people in unsafe, substandard bed sitters across the city. 
Rogers has been critical of the lack of support in boarding houses and shelters for years. She's told me how disappointed she was at the lack of progress she saw during her terms as MHA. Government says they've reduced shelter stays by 38 percent in the last year, but the year before that they went at least 40 percent over budget. This is costing taxpayers so much money. Uh, we've asked the one uh, police officer to estimate the amount of times they were at this house a year, and he said about 100, 100 times. The issues that are going on in that house aren't RNC issues. They're social work issues, they're addiction issues, they're lack of options issues, lack of education issues, and it's not fair to RNC. Hickey wants shelter clients to know she and her neighbors are upset with the system, not with the people being sheltered and that helping hands are all around them. And now I, I just want to help so that we don't have to go through things like that again. A family lost a young man and it didn't have to happen. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Now let's make a sentence now. A hospital. For 40 years, the folks at the Association for New Canadians have been helping people who settle here from other countries, and now they are celebrating the work they've done over those last four decades. That story is still to come. Sure was a windy day out there today. We can thank a low pressure system that's uh, now making its way offshore, and it will continue to do so as we head through the overnight tonight. But there's another system starting to get its act together, and that's headed our way as we head through the night. That's actually going to bring the first messy wintry mix. We can already see some of that uh, rain over parts of Nova Scotia, and that's going to continue to track towards us as we head through the night tonight. Now we do have some wind warnings in place. This is thanks to that low offshore that should end end below or go below warning criteria tonight. But then here's the next round of uh, winter weather moving in. Snowfall warning in place for most of uh, the west and the interior. And then down along the south coast, we have a rainfall warning. I'll get into all the details coming up. Convicted sex offender Matthew Twine is facing a new charge of committing an indecent act. The 33 year old was arrested in October following a complaint about something that happened at Long Pond near Memorial University. But police didn't immediately charge Twine with the crime. Instead, the RNC put out a call for witnesses of the incident. Twine was charged with breaching an order to remain away from that area of Munn's campus, and he has agreed to remain in custody, skipping his bail hearing. There are new questions about lifting a ban on massage parlors in St. John's. The city hosted a public meeting last night to talk about concerns over that move. And multiple people questioned why the city would lift the four-year-old moratorium. In September, the city voted to end a temporary moratorium on any new massage parlors. That's pending new development regulations that would restrict where they can be located in the city. The verbal and written submissions from the public will also be brought back to council. Councillor Maggie Burton pushed for the ban to be lifted and last night she held her ground. People from the community have been talking about how this moratorium, which was put in place without any consultation with the sex working community uh, and people actively involved in the sex trade on the continuum of experience, this was put in place without talking to them in the first place and it has pushed um, the, a lot of people underground into working in unsafe environments. So that was a, a concern that I've been responding to. Well, one of the province's best known and most colorful former politicians is opening up about being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. John Effort says he was diagnosed two years ago. The 75-year-old was a political force in both provincial and federal politics for two decades. And this afternoon, he told the CBC's Jane Aidy that he hopes talking openly about Alzheimer's will help other families who are grappling with the disease. When it comes to the Alzheimer's, I know the result of all the Alzheimer's. I don't go out around public saying what's going to happen and when is it going to happen. I mean, the process has started and I'm going to live one day at a time and do the best I can. And if I can encourage other people to how they approach it with their family, their moms, their dads or whatever, uh, I, I give them some kind of onset and then this is what we should be doing and not just not doing things, but taking someone and put them into a, a room and locking the door and forgetting them. And sometimes that happens too much. As I mentioned, the broadcast Jane 80 sat down with John Effort earlier today and talked more about his diagnosis and his decision to go public with it. Their conversation ahead in about 25 minutes on Here and Now. 
Well, staying with politics, Jerry Byrne is on the attack. The fisheries and aquaculture minister took aim at both NDP and conservative MHAs, accusing one of marginalizing indigenous people and another of possibly breaking the law. All of this while the parties are supposed to be cooperating in a minority legislature. Here now is Peter Cowan is live in our newsroom. So Peter, what's Mr. Byrne saying? Well, the question came to him from Jim Din, an NDP MHA, and he was asking whether Northern Harvest Sea Farms had a plan to deal with warm water before 2.6 million salmon died. And rather than directly answering the question, instead, Jerry Byrne went on the attack. Here's what he said. It is a pattern of behavior. A pattern of behavior. Ask member to direct his comments towards the chair. A pattern of behavior of marginalization of indigenous, and I will speak to that. I'll speak to that. So what prompted that? Well, Jim Din has questioned whether climate change is really behind the death of those farmed salmon, and Byrne says that's disrespecting traditional Mi'kmaq knowledge. That, Byrne insists, backs up that warm water claim. Byrne says it's a pattern because several years ago when Din was head of the Salmonid Association, a member of that group made a comment in a meeting about kowtowing to indigenous groups. Byrne insists that Din was in that meeting and he didn't rebuke the comments strongly enough. But Din insists he not only said those comments were wrong, but the person who made those comments, who was a staff member, has since been let go. So what's behind all this bombast? Well, Din insists this is really just a minister trying to obfuscate criticism about how he's handled the situation. Of course, this is all happening in a minority parliament where the Liberals need at least one MHA from the other side of the House to support them on all their legislative agenda, and they need some of that goodwill from the opposition. And unfortunately, Din says right now that, that goodwill is running out. It's at the point now where the Premier, if he wants to maintain a level of civility, a level of collaboration, a level of cooperation moving forward, then I think it's time for Minister Byrne find another, another, por another portfolio, probably at the back benches of the party and uh, where he can do the least harm. Now, what was that other attack that we saw from Byrne today? Well, that was against PC MHA Jim Lester. He was raising concerns about a farmer who was charged with poaching after he killed a moose on his land. And the attack from Byrne, Byrne said that he not only believes that um, Lester was encouraging poaching, but in fact questioned whether or not he in fact had engaged in that behavior himself. And why was the moose killed? Well, it was busy eating cabbages on the farmer's land. Anthony? Thank you, Peter. Peter Cowan live in our newsroom. John Newey is going to continue on as chief in Natwishish. Newey was the incumbent chief in yesterday's election, and he beat out a familiar name, Simeon Chakapesh, to keep leading the community. Newey says he's relieved to have three more years to continue his work, specifically with the housing crisis. There's overcrowding in Natwishish. Homes have mold, and right now there are 85 families on a wait list for somewhere to live. Lewisport's original town hall is getting a new life. A local businessman is taking over the building and saving some of its memorabilia. Two antique automobiles are the crown jewels of the collection. Here now's Garrett Barry shows us more. This is a 1948 Ford pumper truck. This is the original truck that came to the town and they got it originally with their uniforms, with the rain gear, firefighting gear. Everything came in one package in 1949. Oh, you can run these things, you can still fight a fire with them. Oh yeah, the pumps are here on the back. Um, there's the original pumps. To, this is what they would have carried to the firefighting. This was the original pump that, it's a Hercules power pump. I grew up about six doors up the street here, and uh, I can remember as a child these things going back and forth. I can remember uh, Mr. Freak coming down, to, uh, running down to get aboard the ambulance and take it out and do it there. That was up until the mid-60s that they operated out of this fire hall. This is the original council chambers. It's a civic 
hall. It was it was originally, uh, you know, the original building of the town was discussed and dealt at this table, uh, you know, for all those years, and to be able to keep a part of it, to be able to keep keep it together, it's a pretty neat trick. A lot of the guys that are firemen today, it was their fathers and grandfathers that were firemen here. And the, the fire department crew, I've had them here for a couple times for uh, different events, and, and they love it. They, they think it's a good thing that it's done. Too many times we tear down things that we shouldn't. And I mean, this was one case, as you saw upstairs, uh, this is a very functional building. It can be utilized for the next 70 years as offices or uh, entertainment center. It could be used for anything. A gorgeous truck with a nice soundtrack. The Edge has a new team president. Tyrone Livingston is leaving the Cape Breton Highlanders to join the St. John's basketball franchise. A new boss. The Highlanders are on a one-year hiatus from the NBL. This because of some financial problems and poor ticket sales. The 2019 season is off to a late start this year with a tip-off set for December 26th, Boxing Day. Marking 40 years of welcoming refugees, the Association of New Canadians has a big anniversary as we look back at some of the past refugee arrivals. I'm Lacey. When I was 16, I contracted meningitis and septicemia. 
We're checking back in with people whose lives have changed in an instant. When I think about everything that happened, I almost feel like it happened to somebody else. So it was very, very confusing. Um, oh, it was scary when they, when they said the words meningitis. And to see where they are today. We have a little boy and we have another little boy on the way. <laughs> Lacey Pickett on the next segment of This Is My Story, coming up on Here and Now. Well, before we get to the weather. Yeah, we've got a sweet video to share from you from Beachy Cove Elementary. Take a look. These are the grade four students practicing for the school's Remembrance Day assembly today. And instead of singing, these students are signing the words to John Mayer's song, Waiting for the World to Change. The choir director, Leanne Ryan, chose to include the American Sign Language in today's performance. And Principal Aubrey Daw, who actually has photos on quite a bit, actually, yes, says it's, uh, it's a great way for the school to be inclusive. And that's not easy, so uh, congratulations, Beachy Cove, <laughs> always sort of showing the way. Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, not that I want to complain, but I think I've probably spent about 50 bucks on these things because <laughs> of the wind. Each time you go it's out the door, the away. poppy's gone. you got to find windy, windy, windy. Very windy and very chilly today. Yeah. Those temperatures drop like a rock. Yesterday when we left the studio, it was mm -hmm. 11, 12 degrees. I know. Today, not the case. Nope. Take a look at these current temperatures right now. We're sitting at 3 degrees in St. John's. Not much better really anywhere else. Burgio sitting at 4 degrees, but otherwise... We're near or below zero Lab City sitting at minus seven right now. And with that wind chill feeling much cooler, you know, we talked about how windy it was. Take a look at these numbers, 109 kilometer per hour winds in St. Anthony, Twillingate, 117. And then St. John's area seeing gusts near 81 kilometers per hour. No surprise that we do have those wind warnings in place right now. Still looking at those gusts between 100 and 120 kilometers per hour for the next couple of hours. And as the low pressure system that's currently uh, holding or giving us all these um, windy conditions, that's going to move off and that's going to allow our next weather maker to move in. We did see those uh, lake effect band or sea effect bands earlier today, the snow squalls. They uh, will give way to the potential for some snow tonight. Uh, along the south coast, though, it does look like that will start out as rain anywhere inland or in those higher elevations, we'll see some snow tonight. We could pick up uh, anywhere from two to five centimeters of snow and that all the way towards the early morning hours up through even Gander could potentially see some flurry. So here's a look at your temperatures. You can see anything essentially Gander uh, eastward looking at temperatures above zero and anything to the west there is going to be uh, below zero tonight. Port of Ask will actually see that temperature jump up to about six degrees and then drop like a rock by tomorrow morning. Otherwise, we are going to hang on to these windy conditions through the night, but again, below warning criteria. And we do have some uh, cool temperatures on the way tonight for Lab City going down to minus 14. So that next system's moving in. It is prompting some warnings. Snowfall warnings along the west coast towards the interior, including Grand Falls, Windsor and Burgio. But we also have a rainfall warning in effect, uh, especially along the south coast. You're looking at uh, rain between 40 to 60 millimeters of rain. And if we take a look at what's happening, it's because where that rain snow line mix or rain snow line is, it's very uh, tight gradient. So really any shift in that will determine whether you're going to see heavy rain or heavy snow tomorrow afternoon, especially around Grand Falls, Windsor. So if we take a look at just where that is, you can see it basically cuts Grand Falls, Windsor area in half where you're going to see the snow or you're going to see uh, the rain tomorrow, but really picking up anywhere from 20 to 30 centimeters of snow towards the coast, a lot less, maybe 10 to 15 uh, centimeters of snow. But there's that line I was talking about and anywhere along that line, we could even see the risk of some uh, freezing rain with that. And then anything to the wet or east, is going to see rain and this is the amount of rain that you're going to see. You can see again, this is just through tomorrow morning along the south coast. Then that spreads further north. It could pick up anywhere from 30 to 50 millimeters of rain. So those temperatures are going to be quite different as well. You can see uh, 8 to 12 degrees for the east, west. Not so much. Those temperatures are going to be hovering around the zero or one degree mark. So uh, definitely going to keep that in mind. If you are planning on traveling anywhere, essentially from Gander to Grand Falls, Windsor, you're going to see a little bit of, or you're going to see a big mix in precipitation there. And then up through Labrador, hanging on to these cooler temperatures. Anywhere from Makovic to Happy Valley Goose Bay, you could pick up between 10 to about 15 centimeters of snow tomorrow afternoon. So 
first wintry mix, definitely make sure you're going to take care as you're driving. Thanks, Ashley. The Association for New Canadians is celebrating its 40th anniversary. The group helps newcomers settle into the province, and as the CBC's Cease Hair reports, after 40 years, they are just as busy as ever. Now, let's make a sentence now. A hospital in Mexico City. Very good. Classrooms at the Association for New Canadians ESL Training Center are full every day with over 250 adult students from around the world. Grace Okwara from Uganda is a teacher here now, but she remembers being nervous when she and her husband and two young kids landed in St. John's 26 years ago. All that anxiety was immediately kind of uh, addressed or settled at the right from the airport where we met a team that received us at the airport and it was a team from the Association for New Canadians. The ANC began in 1979 with the Friends of Refugees, which was formed in response to the Southeast Asian refugee crisis. Millions of people jumping on boats, fleeing their countries. Back then, in this province, refugees sometimes walked off planes in Gander, as planes bound for communist countries regularly stopped there for fuel. Sometimes the refugees would come from ships, like this group of Soviet sailors in 1990, young men with children back home. Back then, immigrants and refugees went to the offices on Military Road to get help. Assistance until they could fend for themselves, help with temporary housing, was a big part of the work and still is. Every support imaginable, assistance in running errands and getting some shopping done, still applicable today. Since then, the ANC has evolved, and along with settlement assistance, it offers English and employment education, supports for children, and there's a newly created social enterprise food truck, which sells homemade food from around the world, offering mentorship and training so that newcomers can develop employability and entrepreneurship skills in the food service industry. We have incredible volunteers uh, during the Syrian resettlement in uh, 15, 16, there were just hundreds of volunteers that came out to give of their time, their financial contributions to just work with us to make people feel welcomed. Morris says due to growth and new arrivals, they now have five new satellite offices across the province. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. They diagnosed me with uh, early onset of uh, Alzheimer's. Former longtime politician John Efford opens up about dealing with an Alzheimer's diagnosis.
Welcome back. No stranger to the spotlight, longtime liberal John Efford, who is known for his frankness and his fire. Well, now he's speaking out once again, this time about being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. That is a damn lie. And the Minister of Fisheries in Ottawa knows full well it is a damn lie. We just don't want to go in there and, and, and make things worse for her, so we're going to work very, very slow with her and not frighten her any more than she's already frightened. I single-handedly or anybody else single-handedly cannot call or stop the problem that we're facing. It's a crisis, ladies and gentlemen. Well, during his 20-plus year career, Effort was considered one of the province's most popular politicians. An MHA for his home region of Port de Grave, he later made the move to Ottawa. Effort held multiple portfolios, including Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture, as well as Minister of Social Services. And now at 75, he's once again opening up about his health. Earlier today, he sat down with the broadcast's Jane 80. Here's part of their conversation. You've always been very public about your health. Yeah. Of course, I remember years ago hearing you talk about diabetes and, and your struggle with that. Tell me about what has happened recently. When were you diagnosed with, with Alzheimer's? I can't tell you the exact time, date, but it was approximately two years ago. I was, uh, my doctor recognized something and told my wife about it and they had me set up before I knew what was happening around me. But uh, they diagnosed me with uh, early onset of, uh, of Alzheimer's. And I looked at it the same way I looked at diabetes. Uh, we, I had diabetes now over 40 years and uh, spent a lot of time learning how to manage the diabetes. My daughter is also a diabetic since she was 10 years old. And uh, to, as a family thing, I mean, we always back and forth to help each other. When it comes to the Alzheimer's, I know the result of all the Alzheimer's. I don't go around public saying what's going to happen and when is it going to happen. I mean, the process has started, and I'm going to live one day at a time and do the best I can. And if I can encourage other people to how they approach it with their family, their moms, their dads, or whatever, uh, I, I give them some kind of onset, and, and this is what we should be doing, and not just not doing things, but taking someone and put them into a a room and locking the door and forgetting them and sometimes that happens too much. Why did you want to talk about it public? Just for that reason that you think you can help mm. others struggling with it, other families? That was, that was the main intent. I guess in my, all my life I've been involved from the time I was a young boy chasing my father around Forty Grave. I was always involved and listened very intensely to the conversations that people would have around. We didn't call it Alzheimer's in those days. But the fact that uh, you can talk about it and open up a dialogue, I think it gives the people some, uh, some support. And I mean, I personally have had a lot of support from friends and from other people uh, with the diabetes over the years at work. Well, I guess it's just a natural thing for me to do is to talk about it. I'm not looking for anything. Um, I'm hoping that there's going to be enough research that's going to be done that's going to, we're going to get some benefit from it sometime in the future. And, but I don't hear a lot about that now, the research in Alzheimer's. Uh, not, not in Canada, not in this area. In Australia and other places, you hear a lot of research is going ahead. So maybe if more people like you talk about it publicly, you're hoping that that might prompt yeah. talk, more interest. Talk yeah. about the possibility of what can happen in a positive way, not a negative way. Mm -hmm. When it affects you, uh, how does it manifest itself? How well, do you feel? Mostly when I'm tired. I know it, I, I'm talking and I, all of a sudden my, I lose the thought of the words that I was trying to say and that will go on for a while. And so it, 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 uh, it's a mis mishap in, in, in how I would speak continuously and that's not like me. <laughs> but uh, it happened. I've got to deal with it now and I'm, I'm dealing with it in a positive way that I can survive as long as, it, as, I, as, long as I possibly can and think positive about it because there's no good getting up every day complaining. Well, I've got Alzheimer's. What am I going to? I'm not going to go out anywhere today. I'm going to be the same person. I'll always talk about things, and I'll hopefully pass some information along or gain some information from what's actually happening. It strikes me as a very generous thing for you to do to talk public about something that is probably affecting you so personally and your family and friends. 
but are you aware now that people might be watching you to kind of monitor the progress of this? Are, are you comfortable with that? Yeah. I have no reason not to be comfortable. You know, I mean, there's, there's something that's not, it's not going to walk away. It's not going to go away. So you've got to learn how to live with it and be as normal as you possibly can. What advice would you give for people watching or listening now uh, who have family members struggling with the same disease? What would you advise well, them to do? What I would advise them to do is to accept the fact that their mom, their dad, their brother, their sister, someone they, they is diagnosed with, uh, with Alzheimer's, uh, you're not going to be able to jump up, made, wave a magic wand, and, and things are going to change to improve. It's going to be a slow process, but more people need to be involved. More people need to be uh, speaking out, uh, you know, and, and talking to your doctor and talking about what is the best thing to do. Because, I mean, a lot of people just forget well, what nothing we can do is negative and what, what the, the future is not very bright. But if you go talking like that, you'll never get a cure. Mm -hmm. So the positive attitude helps positive in all, all attitude, respects. Positive attitude, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for speaking with me. I wish you uh, only the best with your health. Thank you very much. Well, Jane did a great job there. Now, some of today's politicians are speaking out about Efford's illness, including Pam Parsons, the current Liberal MHA for Harbour Grace Port de Grave, the area that Efford once represented in the House of Assembly. I think John Efford uh, continues to show true leadership today. Uh, when he started his career, when he was elected back in 1985, I mean, he, uh, you know, he made no bones about it, what, what was on his mind and what, he, what his aim was, and he was always determined, and I think he's still doing that to this very day. How did John Effort influence you and, uh, and how you do politics or got into this game? Well, I've known John all my life, actually. My mom used to work for John years ago when she was a young woman. And, of course, his daughter actually was my figure skating coach when I was a kid. And so he's, he's been a very influential person in our region, really. And uh, I can remember, actually, when I was a journalist, and I've always had it in my heart to uh, put myself forward for political, political life. And I talked to him about it back then. And I said, you know, it's something I'd like to get involved in. And he said, well, I'd, I'd have to support you. And I said, what if I were to ever run PC? He said, now you're pushing it. <laughs> but he's always been, and even to this day, uh, you know, he reaches out, he'll give me a phone call, he'll invite me to come down, you know, for a cup of tea down to his home. Um, he's been there to every campaign launch that I've had. He's been there front and center to support me, and I certainly appreciate his experience and his advice. It's, it's brave to make a diagnosis like that known. He's also offered uh, himself to be supportive to other people who might be struggling with the same diagnosis. Uh, you know, it's part of the aging process with many people. Many of us here in this room may have to struggle with that diagnosis ourselves. So uh, I just had a chat with John and uh, reminisced how when he retired, my father had been one of the roasters at a roast for his retirement. And I asked him if he had a tape of the, uh, of the roast because I'm sure there were some zingers and, you know, great insults delivered that would be worthwhile recycling for some other occasion in the future. But it seems that John doesn't have the tape, so.
Well, this will frighten you if you're afraid of doctors. A new study on surgical practices reveals some unsettling news. It says the number of objects that are unintentionally left inside patients is growing, and it's not clear why. The study was conducted by the Canadian Institute for Health Information, and it says, as you can see there, 553 objects, including sponges and medical instruments, were left inside patients between 2016 and 2018. And that is actually a 14% increase over five years. That's more than twice the average rate of the 12 countries that were surveyed. Advocates for patient safety call the numbers alarming and they're demanding a better tracking system for objects that are used in the operating room. Well, shifting to politics now, Liberal MPs gathered on Parliament Hill today. It was their first informal meeting since the federal election transformed their fortunes from majority to minority government. We were able to accomplish as a team for Canadians uh, was significant and uh, they will be a part of that forever in terms of the, the big things we were able to do. Uh, but obviously there's uh, a lot more to do. Today's meeting was a chance to congratulate newly minted MPs as well as to say farewell to outgoing colleagues. The party now has or holds rather 157 seats. That's 13 seats shy of a majority in the Commons. The Liberals are shut out entirely in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is keeping his Chief of Staff, Katie Tetford. And we have an update now on Ryan Stretsnitsky, and that is the person you might recall, the humble Bronco player who was left paralyzed by that horrific bus crash. Ryan's worked harder ever since to try to rega regain some movement, and now he's in Bangkok, Thailand, recovering from surgery that could be life-changing. Carolyn Dunn reports. Just one day after surgery and this. <laughs> he almost did both at the one time. Ryan Strashnitsky's paralyzed leg is moving, the result of an implant that sends electrical currents down his spine. Back in Airdrie, Alberta, Ryan's mom, Michelle, is watching that video yet again. Just to see that smile on his face, that, that was genuine. He was as surprised as the rest of us, I think. This is proof, <laughs> proof that you can't give up faith. You can't give up hope. Something good might be around the corner. Yeah. The best case scenario is that he'll have some significant recovery and functional um, uh, movements where then they'll last for the rest of his life. Aaron Phillips has been studying the epidural implant procedure for almost a decade. I think the worst case scenario is that he maintains this obvious restoration of some movement below his limbs that you're seeing today. The device sends electrical signals down pathways that are preserved but dormant. Awakening those pathways can help with movement but also improve bladder, bowel and heart functions. And Ryan, who is paralyzed from the chest down, hopes it will give him some core control to improve his para-hockey game. Dr. Richie Gill is a paraplegic who had two devices implanted in Thailand. It was his improved movement that inspired Ryan to travel the same path. It's a really uh, positive experience when you start seeing um, the small movements and start the process of mapping, which is really programming the device uh, to allow you to be able to do some of those movements within your legs. Ryan has five weeks of nearly full-time physio ahead of him in Bangkok. I, I just dare him to do whatever he wants to do. It's a pretty safe bet that Ryan Strashnitsky will take that dare. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Airdrie, Alberta.
Okay, a little question for your riddle, maybe, or a science question, I'm not sure, either. <laughs> How do you weigh a horse? A, a scale? Okay, <laughs> yeah, well, you need it very carefully is the answer. You need an industrial scale, and the RNC has partnered with A. Harvey for more than a decade to make sure that their horses are in tip-top shape. Yeah, and Harvey even donated a horse to the mounted unit aptly named Harvey, and Arianna Kellen dropped down to the harbor front to check it out. We're down to weigh a castle to see uh, as a four-year-old horse uh, that he's a proper weight for his age. This is about a community partnership uh, with Harvey down here at the harbor front. Uh, allow us to come down and use these truck scales to uh, weigh our horse. Is he at the weight he should be at? Uh, is there different uh, care or uh, processes that we need to consider ensuring that you know he's the proper weight health wise and it's just about taking care of our horses. 1450 pounds. Is that a yeah, good weight? That's a fantastic weight for a four-year-old horse. Perfect. Good job, Castle. <laughs> right on cue. Right on cue. Yeah, Ariana's got that magic touch. All right, right now yeah. come on. Nay for me. <laughs> Uh, so you have a kind of uh, Neapolitan forecast for us. It does look like that, doesn't it? Yeah, I've seen what you're going to show us, yeah, so it, we'll take a look. It's a little more, uh, I'd say the Neapolitan ice cream is a little bit more tasty, though, than what's going to happen weather-wise. It is, <laughs> it is our first... Do you remember that ice cream? I do remember that and ice you cream. See, you see your pink, all the snow and rain? That's the part nobody eats. It's definitely the part I didn't eat. <laughs> Chocolate and vanilla so all let's the way. let's get rid of it. There you go. <laughs> if we could only get rid of that for tomorrow, uh, that would be nice. But no, we are in for that first wintry mix of weather tomorrow so if you don't have your snow tires on tonight is the time to do it uh, otherwise we are looking at uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier that tight gradient somewhere between Grand Falls Windsor and Gander really uh, where we're either going to see snow or rain so definitely be prepared for that if you are traveling tomorrow I wouldn't recommend it but if you uh, absolutely have to be definitely keep that in mind so there's a look at that low pressure system anything to the east of that will be rain and anything to the west of that will be snow and then in behind that we're going to see some cooler temperatures move in which means we're going to see that snow move right back in or at least flurries move right back in throughout the overnight and we get back into that onshore flow along the west coast so saturday looks like it will be breezy and that potential for some flurries again for the southeastern portion of labrador and then along the west coast as well for the island. Now in behind that we are going to see a little bit of a break on Saturday evening into Sunday as a ridge of high pressure moves in. But uh, by the time Sunday morning rolls around again, we're looking at that risk of onshore flurries for the West Coast and then the next system will move in on Monday. So unfortunately, it looks like we've turned on that snow machine and uh, we are looking at over the next week or so pretty much a storm every couple of days is going to move through. So uh, here's a look at your Saturday though those temperatures Friday are going to be beautiful on the on the East Coast and then they're going to drop like a rock for Saturday. It's going to feel significantly cooler, only reaching a high near between uh, minus one and one uh, island wide, minus five up through Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Lab City. You're going to hang on to those double digit below zero temperatures and Nain, we're looking at minus five tomorrow. So over the next couple of days, we are in for a little bit of a roller coaster. We dip back down for the weekend and then by Monday, another push of warm air moves in and that means some showers will move in along with that and then into Tuesday back down to the low single digits, but uh, that chance of showers and then clearing skies through the afternoon. For central Newfoundland, zero to one degree. It's gonna be the opposite actually. You're gonna see your temperatures climb into Monday and then Tuesday dip back down again with that potential for some flurries overnight and into the day on Tuesday. For Western Newfoundland, zero degrees and then four by Sunday, nine on Monday with uh, rain changing to snow overnight. You can see your temperatures dip down to minus four. And then for Labrador tomorrow along the coast and towards Happy Valley Goose Bay, you're looking at about 10 to 15 centimeters of snow. The snow will generally continue right through the weekend. And then we're looking at a similar forecast temperature wise on Saturday for Western Labrador minus 10 dipping down to minus 25 overnight. So we're certainly getting into those chilly temperatures, Anthony. Thanks, Ashley. Kombucha is all the rage. It's fizzy, fermented, and as it turns out, maybe a little bit uh, boozy. New research in BC is finding that kombucha may contain more alcohol than advertised. And as Tina Lovegreen explains, for some, that could spell trouble. 
Inside this research lab, they're testing some of the trendiest health drinks in Canada. Almost 800 tubes delivered by health officials containing samples of kombucha, collected from grocery stores and farmers markets in BC. Their mission? To find out how much alcohol is in each one. Because they're not supposed to have more than a certain amount of alcohol in them. Uh, the limit in Canada is 1%. Alcohol is a natural byproduct of the fermented tea, which has been growing in popularity amongst Canadians. More brewers are popping up across the country. Some like the taste, while others believe it has probiotic benefits. It's sold, though, as a non-alcoholic beverage. Yes, here we have a fermenting kombucha. Brewing the stuff isn't pretty, and it's not always predictable. Its live ingredients can continue fermenting if it's not refrigerated properly and that elevates alcohol levels. If they leave the, the bottle outside for a day or for two days, it can start fermenting and can increase the alcohol level, so people should be careful and keep refrigerated at all times. If there are uh, trace amounts of alcohol, uh, even low levels, I think it's important that those labels also be on the bottles. for the BC health officials are so concerned, they're now the first in Canada to formally research it. Low levels of alcohol can be a concern in women who are pregnant and, and are seeking to avoid alcohol to protect their babies and the baby's development uh, for small children. In the U.S., more than a quarter of the kombucha tested was above the legal threshold, some even as high as 7%. That's more than your average beer. But here in BC, we haven't seen the same results yet. The message isn't that kombucha isn't safe, it's just that some kombucha has elevated ethanol levels, and that could be a public safety concern. The results of the BC tests are expected this month, which could explain what kind of punch this drink could have. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Burnaby.
so right to the picture, I guess we didn't get there yet. No, we didn't. Let's okay. take a look at it. It's uh, pretty well known, I would say. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Everyone's going to get this. That's Little Bell Island right there. Little what? <laughs> little Bell Island. <laughs> okay. It's in South Carolina somewhere? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that picture was taken in uh, Paradise. That's actually Topsail Beach. The mm -hmm. view from uh, the bluff up there, Topsail yep. Bluff. Thank you so much to Paul Piercy for sending yep. us that wonderful All photo. All kinds of interesting things have happened up there. Oh, I'm sure. But we'll save that for a future edition of Here and Now. Yeah, I haven't been up there yet. I wanted to get up there this summer and never did make it get a chance to. Yes. Well, I'll tell you about what you can look forward to when the show is over. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Gorgeous spot. Of course, very popular place, too. Yep. Kayaking there, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, better. there you go. Okay. Yeah. When the winds aren't too bad. Thanks a lot for watching. Karen's going to be here instead of me tomorrow in this job. I'll still be around, but just not right here. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll see you tomorrow anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> good night.